Welcome to this podcast. I'm here with Rick Strassman. Rick Strassman is an American clinical associate professor of psychiatry at the University of New Mexico School of Medicine. He has held a fellowship in clinical psychopharmacology research at the University of California, San Diego, and was professor of psychiatry for 11 years at the University of New Mexico. After 20 years of intermission, Strassman was the first person in the United States to undertake human research with psychedelic, hallucinogenic, or entheogenic substances with his research on NN dimethyltryptamine, also known as DMT. He is also the author of the well-known book, DMT, the Spirit Molecule, which summarizes his academic research into DMT and experimental studies regarding the substance and also includes his own reflections and conclusions based on the scientific research. Thanks for joining me, Rick. It's a real honor to have you here. Oh, well, thanks, Jake. My pleasure. I, I was telling you a bit before, but I had read your book, DMT, The Spirit Molecule, when I first began getting interested in psychedelics before I had ever used DMT or really had too much experience with psychedelics. And it was really fascinating and eye-opening the many vivid accounts of the DMT experience that you painted in the book. Um, and my own experiences with DMT since have been some of the most fascinating experiences I think I've had in my entire life. And also some of the most difficult experiences to talk about because they seem to go into this realm that is beyond our ability to speak about. Um, I'm really interested in how you became involved in this type of work and how you became curious about DMT as a subject worth seriously studying, as well as how DMT has personally affected your own life, if you're willing to speak about your own personal experiences with it. Um, well, you know, to begin with, the idea that, you know, that it's hard to express uh, what happens in the DMT state, uh, it you know, doesn't mean that we don't need to try. Um, you know, there's a uh, convenient idea that the psychedelic experience is ineffable. Uh, there are no words to describe it. But, uh, you know, that's not true. I mean, there's a lot of words to describe it. I mean, in the DMT book, there's a lot of words that describe people's experiences that they told me, you know, so um, it might be difficult to describe it. And that's why we need a good vocabulary and a good understanding of what the experience entails. Uh, and we need to figure out the best possible way of getting information from that experience. Uh, and all of those things are verbal, they're words. Uh, so, uh, you know, that's an idea that uh, I think is a bit too easy to just accept that the experience is ineffable because it is, <clears throat> you know, hard to describe, but at the you know, same time, you describe it as one of the most, you know, fascinating experiences of your life. And so, you know, why that was the case, uh, I think is an important issue to share. Um, so I got started uh, with my interest in psychedelics uh, in college. Um, I was introduced to Buddhism and meditation around that time and uh, the psychedelic drugs, and they seemed to resemble each other in certain ways. Uh, so I thought there must be a you know, biological common denominator uh, that was activated on psychedelics and in response to meditation. Uh, you know, so I uh, kind of, 
you know, kept that under my hat for a long time, but got as well trained as I could uh, in order to do real research with the you know, psychedelics. Um, so I started off looking at the pineal gland and its hormone melatonin, which at the time in the late 70s, early 80s, there wasn't much known about its clinical effects in humans, and there were some data suggesting it was quite psychoactive. Uh, so we studied melatonin very carefully, um, and it you know, turned out to be only sedating. Uh, but in you know, the meantime, I learned about uh, you know, DMT. Um, you know, I was interested in the pineal because of its you know, long history of you know, veneration in esoteric physiologies. The, uh, the Hindu you know, chakra system, the you know, Kabbalistic sephirot system, uh, and the pineal gland, at least its anatomical location, corresponded with the subjective experience of the highest mental states, or at least you know, the uh, you know, focal point of those experiences, you know, the origination, uh, you know, where it first appears anyway. Um, you know, so you know, there wasn't much known about melatonin, uh, but um, you know, there were some studies uh, indicating its you know, psychoactivity. Um, and also the you know, pharmacology and the you know, physiology of the pineal you know, was consistent with a role for you know, producing spiritual experiences. Uh, but it you know, turned out to be uh, you know, neuroendocrinely interesting, but you know, psychologically not so much. Uh, and I learned about you know, DMT, uh, which is also made in the body, including uh, the you know, body of every mammal it's been looked for so far, and hundreds, if not thousands, of plants. Um, you know, so it is an endogenous compound in the human. It's made uh, you know, th um, you know, through an uh, enzymatic process that's pretty well understood. Uh, and it's quite psychoactive, quite psychedelic. Uh, it occurs as the visionary component in ayahuasca in one of the plants. Uh, it was discovered to be you know, psychedelic in humans in the 50s, was discovered in body fluids in the, the 60s, and uh, you know, saw some uh, study um, uh, in Hungary and in uh, the US on its you know, psychedelic effects. Um, you know, so it had been given safely as well, uh, and that allowed me to expedite the uh, process with the FDA. I didn't have to prove that it uh, you know, could be given safely. So, um, you know, I was interested, you know, if you gave DMT and it produced spiritual experiences which resemble those which were, uh, you know, caused by, uh, you know, non-drug technologies, you know, if, if, if giving tea mimicked certain features of the near-death experience, let's say, you know, one can then argue for a, a case, you know, that elevated levels of, you know, DMT, uh, which occur naturally, you know, um, once you approach death, uh, you know, would increase as well, you know, to the extent that there is overlap in the syndromes. Um, and uh, from a spiritual point of view, I was you know, looking at it to determine if there was a resemblance between the Buddhist uh, experience of Kensho or Samadhi or you know, Satori um, compared to the DMT effect. Uh, so, you know, those were the you know, hypotheses and, you know, the goals, you know, the directions that my study took. Uh, and but you know first and you know foremost it was a you know, psychopharmacology study, uh, you know dose response you know measure a lot of endocrine variables psychological variables, uh, the, you know those more abstract mm -hmm. uh, questions that I brought to bear in the study were implicit. Mm -hmm. You've been a practicing Zen Buddhist for a while, right? I think I remember reading that. Well, I've been, yeah, I've been you know, practicing you know, for a long time since my early 20s. Um, and I studied it quite intensely for uh, maybe 22, 23 years under the supervision of the Zen monastery. Um, I was ordained as a layman in the order, uh, you know, founded and helped run a you know, meditation group 
which was uh, affiliated with that organization. Um, we parted ways at a certain point in uh, the mid you know 1990s, uh, and it you know curiously enough was over the issue of psychedelics, um, mm -hmm. and you know that you know you know, uh, so that allowed me you know then to resume. Uh, or you know to you know renew uh, my interest in Judaism. Mm -hmm. Yeah, beautiful. I think that the esoteric uh, Jewish tradition is very rich as well, and I'm curious about the similarities with DMT and mystical and religious experiences, which is something that you've also written about. And um, Benny Shannon, for example, proposed that the theophany that Moses received on Mount Sinai was perhaps a DNT or ayahuasca analog experience because there are uh, similarities in the, in the types of experience. And many people receive what some may call downloads or people receive information that they didn't previously have access to on these powerful psychedelics. And I'm just curious um, if you feel that DMT has played a role in the formation of religions throughout history uh, or that some of the early mystical experiences in human history were a result of the use of DMT or other psychedelics. Uh, well, you know, when you're speaking about spiritual or mystical or re um, or religious experiences, in a way, those all differ. Um, it's you know common to lump them together, but uh, you know, I think if we're going to advance in the field, we uh, we, we you know benefit from uh, you know defining terms as clearly as we can, so that we can then. You know, study them uh, in a you know pure you know, form, as it were. Um, you know, spiritual experiences. I mean, spiritual uh, denotes uh, or implies um, strong feelings, uh, strong emotions, uh, rarefied ideas that seem to have special significance. Um, certain, you know, moral. Uh, sensations or notions, uh, you know, do good, don't do evil, you know, the conviction of the truth of those things. Um, you know, so, so spiritual is, you know, is, you know kind of like a state of consciousness. Uh, it has um, certain phenomenological uh, features. Uh, you know, they're emotional, they're cognitive, they're affective, they're biological, you know, your body. Um, spiritual is the more of an umbrella term. And you know, then you could start to, you know, categorize, you know, what are the uh, you know, categories of spiritual experience? You know, so, you know, there's religious experience, uh, which occurs in the, uh, in the you know, setting of an organized or a discrete religion, you know. So, um, a religious experience in the Catholic Church is different than that in the evangelical church was, um, which is different than that experienced in the synagogue. Uh, you know, but they all occur in the context of a religion. Um, you know, so you can have spiritual experience with uh, spiritual experiences which occur in other settings, you know, like in nature or uh, exposed to particular forms or examples of art. Um, you know, so those are spiritual, but they're not religious. Um, and when you're talking about either, uh, you know, religious experience or spiritual, but not religious experience, you can then, you know, divide it further into you know, mystical unitive kinds of states or interactive relational ones. You know, so the mystical unitive state can occur within a context of, you know, nature, let's say, or in a you know, religious organization, or a mystical experience can occur, uh, 
you know, completely, it, you know, can occur completely on its own. Um, and the you know features of the mystical unitive experience is the obliteration of the ego, the you know, sense of self. There's no time. There's no space. There's no ideas, thinking, feeling. Uh, you know, kind of the white light of the void experience. Uh, and you know that was the kind of state that both myself and the volunteers were expecting most commonly in response to you know, DMT, but it didn't quite come about. But, um, you know, so there's, you know, the mystical unitive state, you know, it's ineffable. Um, there's no boundaries, those kinds of things, uh, compared to the interactive relational state, uh, which was more common in the DMT volunteers. Uh, and right. that's an experience, you know, where you maintain your sense of self, you interact with your environment, you know, the environment is chock full of content, uh, you know, there's verbal information. Um, yeah, you know, so you maintain yourself, you interact with the contents as opposed to, you know, merging, you know, with the all. You know, so, you know, that's the kind of effect of DMT. It's more interactive and relational, which is one of the reasons it, uh, you know, pushed me in the direction of studying prophecy. Um, with respect to, you know, you know, was Moses high at the burning bush? Uh, you know, from DMT released by a acacia bush. Um, you know, God only knows. Uh, but it, you know, points, you know, to the issue of, you know, do you need exogenous, you know, psychedelics for spiritual experiences to occur? You know, do you need to take a plant or smoke a plant or eat a mushroom or um, those kinds of things? Uh, or can they occur spontaneously or, uh, you know, from within? Um, uh, you know, can those same chemical effects occur and, you know, can, you know, can those same biological brain chemistry effects occur endogenously? Um, you know, so if you, you know, posit, for example, the increase of DMT occurring for, you know, some other reason, you know, than the ingestion of an outside agent, uh, you're freed from, you know, needing to search uh, constantly for some, uh, you know, psychedelic that spiritual, you know, teachers or experiences are, uh, you know, caused by. Uh, you know, so, um, you know, the presence of you know, DMT in the bloodstream, in the brain. We now know that DMT is is made in the mammalian brain. Uh, you can then start, you know, looking, you know, more for things that stimulate the formation of endogenous DMT than outside sources of it. Um, you know, whether or not, uh, you know, religions were formed through the ingestion of plants, uh, you know, you know, these religions didn't just, you know, drop out of the sky. You know, they were the result of ideas combined with certain experiences, which confirmed those ideas, made them more convincing. Uh, so I think when you're looking at the origin of religions, you need to look, you know, more at the content of the religion than, you know, necessarily it's, you know, the you know, biological, you know, cementing of, you know, those ideas, you know, because I think, you know, that's the main function of, you know, psychedelics is they don't, you know, necessarily give you new information, but they can uh, convince you of the truth and the reality and the meaning of what you're already believing or not quite sure you believe or unconsciously uh, believe. So, um, it isn't that you take a drug and you have certain, you know, religions that, you know, form de novo. Uh, I think they're, you know, more in, you know, line with the, you know, development of the ideas and the behaviors that are associated with, uh, you know, those kinds of notions. You know, the ideas come first, I believe, and mm -hmm. you know, those take place in the person. Mm. Yeah, you're probably right about that, and I think that when you see these experiences written about in history, they're very much informed by the cultures from which they come from. 
Um, and likewise, I mean, people interpret their psychedelic experiences quite differently and dependent on their cultural background as well. I like you bringing up the point of being discerning and your use of vocabulary to describe either spiritual or mystical experiences. It seems to me that DMT provokes what you might call prophetic experiences, though, that people have revelations on DMT in a way that it's, it's different than just a feeling of, of interconnectedness because it really stretches the boundaries of our perception into something much more bizarre. And I don't have 20 years of disciplined meditation practice, for example, but I have had some vaguely psychedelic experiences without taking any substances. But the DMT experience, when I've smoked DMT, it's such a high octane, bizarre, intense, altered state experience. I'm curious if you've seen any evidence of an experience on the same level of an altered consciousness as significant as when people take DMT occurring spontaneously without taking any external substance. Well, you know, the bizarre nature of the DMT state, I think, contributes to its you know, sense of convincingness um, that there's no way you could imagine uh, these things appearing and, uh, you know, doing what they're doing, um, both to you and, uh, you know, to their space. Um, so, you know, that's, you know, the phenomenology. That's what they look like, what they you know, feel like, what they you know, sound like. Um, they're, what they're doing to your body. Um, but, you know, the information itself, uh, when you, you know, boil it down, the, the you know, verbal transmission, as it were, um, isn't anywhere near as rich uh, compared to the phenomenology. Uh, when people return from the, their DMT experiences, you know, they were able to describe in really fine detail the nature of the state, uh, but they weren't able to articulate much, inf uh, much, you know, novel information uh, about, you know, what was contained in the state. You know, what did it mean? Uh, you know, how were they going to live their lives differently? What new ideas did they come back with that they didn't have before? Uh, so in the case of the you know, cognitive content, I think it was, it was an amplification or a conviction of you know, pre-existing you know, cognitive content. If, for example, they weren't sure about a career decision, you know, they might just be overwhelmed by the truth of a particular idea that you know, comes in in the DMT state. And they then, uh, you know, for whatever reason, feel much more secure in making one you know, decision versus the other or in not making a decision. But, you know, there's a truth value uh, which is contained uh, there, uh, which I don't think, you know, necessarily is true, but it feels true. Uh, and that's good enough uh, for uh, most, you know, situations. Uh, you know, you need peer review and you know, feedback, but... Uh, you know, generally just being convinced of the truth of, you know, something, if it's not, you know, crazy, if it, it with, if it's within the, you know, borders of your life, uh, then uh, it seems to be a good way to, you know, make decisions. Um, when you talk about, you know, prophecy, um, you know, it's a pet uh, theory of, mine and i feel it's quite important but it's kind of subtle um and uh it you know relates to the notion of overreaching you know one of the concerns i have about you know psychologists and psychiatrists speaking about mystical experiences is they don't really know what they're talking about uh they're mostly you know talking about uh, scores on rating scales and phenomenological descriptions of the experience 
but you know is this a mystical experience would somebody you know living in a cave for you know 50 years you know come down and speak to that person and you know, certify that it was a true mystical experience or not i don't think that's been done yet um you know so i think one needs to be you know careful of overreaching and when i'm talking about dmt and the prophetic experience you know, I need to be careful of overreaching as well. Um, I I'm, I'm think I can m make the case that I'm not, but at first, you know, blush, it would seem to be a comparable case of overreaching. Um, you know, it's a, well, you, um, you know, the mystical experience is, is in a way universal and generic. Uh, there's no content, you know, so there's nothing to argue about. Um, in, uh, you know, but still, I'm not sure if it's a mystical experience or not. Uh, but it's a convenient term, uh, and it's you know not that controversial. Um, th th you know, the prophetic experience, uh, as laid you know down in the Hebrew Bible, is you know first of all interactive and relational, um, and uh, I think, you know, for that reason, it's a good, uh, you know, model for understanding, you know, the DMT experience, um, which is interactive and relational. Um, you know, but if you were to develop a rating scale for the prophetic state and somebody scored high, would you say that person experienced prophecy? And the question, and, you know, the answer is no. You know, prophecy is a whole, you know, package. Uh, it's defined by the Hebrew Bible. Um, it's got constraints. Uh, yeah, you know, so for it's, you know, some guy to come in off the street and be and you know be given you know DMT and his score on the you know, prophetic experience scale goes through the roof. You know, is that person a prophet? You know, did that person experience prophecy? And I think most people would say no. But still, it was a you know facsimile, a you know pharmacologically induced you know replica, and you know that isn't you know to say that you don't get a lot out of it. Like I've got a you know facsimile a, a, um, a print you know, reproduction of uh, you know the Annunciation um, of the angel Frangelica. you know speaking you know to Mary, yeah you know saying you're about to give birth to the lord you know and it's an incredible painting um i saw it at the national gallery in washington dc um it was restored and displayed for a while you know so i got a print and i look at that print and i'm inspired you know it's an inspiring it's, it's an inspiring vision you know so you know you can have a you know uh, a you know mystical experience in uh you know laboratory setting and be moved, you know, to have your life changed utterly. Uh, but that doesn't mean it was a mystical experience. It was a peak, you know, psychedelic experience. It was the optimal, you know, psychedelic state. But, um, you know, I think one needs to, uh, you know, keep, you know, modest in one's claims. And in the, you know, same way, you know, somebody, you know, may have an experience on DMT or you know something else, and it looks like prophecy. It feels like prophecy. It's got this you know, same impact on the person, uh, you know. But it's not prophecy. It's you know it's you know, prophecy like or you know, prophecy you know mimetic. Um, it you know might be helpful to step back and uh, you know define uh, you know prophecy the way I do. Uh, most people think about it as foretelling or predicting. Uh, but in the you know, sense that I use it in my 2014 book, DMT and the Soul of Prophecy, uh, I define it as any spiritual experience, uh, uh, experienced by anybody in the text. It could be a you know nameless you know, foot soldier you know that has a you know, predictive dream. Uh, it could be um, you know David being inspired to write the Psalms. Uh, it could be, you know, Jonathan being inspired to, you know, shoot the arrow in the direction that he did. Or it could be the, you know, full-blown DMT-like experiences of Ezekiel uh, or the mm -hmm. very, you know, verbal expressions of Jeremiah and Isaiah. Or, you know, Moses, you know, receiving the, you know, Ten Commandments. Um, 
Yeah, you know, so it 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 can vary. You know, the Egyptian slave of you know Sarah, uh, whose um, whose name is Hagar, was you know visited by angels um, a number of times. Um, you know, so it's any spiritual experience that's recounted in the text, and it's interactive and relational. It's more real than real. Uh, the you know, sensations, the perceptions, the you know, the mood changes, the effects in your body, you know, those are all quite you know, similar to what happens with DMT. You know, but the you know, source is different. The, the stimulation of endogenous DMT, if that you know, plays a role, uh, is you know, mediated differently. You know, the information content is, you know, is uh, you know, quite a lot richer. Well, I think that this gets at one of the main subjects of debate when it comes to spiritual experiences and psychedelics, which is that if you have a profound ex a spiritual, prophetic, mystical experience while you're on a psychedelic, is that still a valid or legitimate spiritual experience? And um, I think that as long as the experience is as, as long as the experience has a tangible impact on the life of the person who experiences it and it benefits not only that person, but others, that it is a legitimate spiritual experience. Um, but it seems that somebody receiving, somebody having a vision of angels that occurs spontaneously and them receiving information in that sense, uh, that that would seem much more significant than somebody having the same experience while on DMT. And there have been many experiences. I don't know if I've personally experienced this myself, but I've read many accounts of it where people do seem to receive information in the DMT space that is beyond their previous understanding or their previous experience like receiving some kind of um insight into how and into how to build a particular piece of technology or something that maybe they don't even have the understanding of how to go about but then you know they're synchronistically drawn after the experience towards sources of information that may help them achieve that you know so which is quite an archetypal experience i'm just curious what you think about those things um well when it comes to the question of you know drug induced versus non-drug induced spiritual experiences oh oh i didn't uh get back to your question about if non-drug states can be like a dmt experience oh yes uh, please you know my answer is you know not very often yeah you know not very often uh yeah, you know, psychedelics are much more reliable and consistent in their effects than meditation. I mean, you can have very you know, psychedelic meditation experiences. Uh, there's Buddhist, you know, sutras, you know, Hindu texts, which are quite psychedelic, resulting from most likely just meditation. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, uh, I would say, well, you know, I've been, you know, meditating for a long time. Uh, and uh, I've never really had anything, you know, like a psychedelic experience uh, on, or, you know, you know, practicing meditation, even for days and days and days on end. Um, so, yeah. Um, well, the question about, you know, let's say, you know, meditation-induced uh, spiritual experiences or any kind of experience uh, compared to those brought on by a you know, psychedelic yeah i think the point you made is true you know it's what do you do with the experience you know do be you know do you become a better person and are you contributing you know to your you know social uh you know network um yeah and i think you know calling it spiritual or not uh or i think you know calling it spiritual isn't that important uh you know that's where I think there's overreach uh, that occurs within you know, psychedelic you know, subculture. Um, <clears throat> it you know, might you know, feel spiritual, 
but I mean, who cares? I mean, you know, like you said, uh, if you're a better person or not is the most important thing. Um, you know, if you want your psychedelic experiences to be more spiritual, you know, then you need to be a more spiritual person in your daily life, you know, fill your head with, you know, spiritual texts, let's say, as opposed to Facebook, um, or, you know, eat good food, as opposed to eating bad food. Uh, you, you know, try to be nice to people, even if you don't succeed, you know, think it's an important thing. Uh, you know, so if you're working on those kinds of issues during the day, you know, during your, you know, everyday state of consciousness, the, you know, the, uh, the chances are good that those issues will come up during your psychedelic experience and you'll be able to, you know, gnaw on them from that new perspective and then, you know, gain more benefit from those ideas and practices or behaviors, uh, you know, subsequently. Um, so, uh, you know, whether or not the information that people appear to download on any, you know, psychedelic state, but especially kind of communicated, you know, through the entities or the beings in the DMT state, um, you know, is that external information? Is it existing, some, you know, some other place like, you know, like, uh, next door, uh, and you're, and uh, because of the effect of the DMT on your mind and brain, uh, you're able to hear it or receive it in a way that you couldn't before. It was you know previously invisible, <clears throat> you know. So, uh, you know this you know relates to the strangeness of the DMT state as a means by which what's apprehended there is you know, so convincing. It's you know, so strange, it's convincing, like this is really happening, uh, as opposed to, well, is this really happening? You know, there's just no question. Um, so I think you know, that contributes to the confusion about where does that information originate from? Is the information that you now believe is totally true uh, is that because it's brand new information from the outside or is it because it was there all along but you weren't aware of it or you didn't feel that strongly about it but now you do um, so i think it pertains or i think you know the answer or at least you know one way of approaching it is what you were talking about earlier you know it doesn't really matter if it's from the inside or from the outside you know what do you do with it and is it helpful or not? So that's my take. Yeah. And I, I wanted to talk to you about the beings and entities which you mentioned, because it's very common that people have experiences of non-corporeal entities or higher intelligences that seem to possess their own autonomy within the DMT space. And do you care to comment about that? I'm curious if you are convinced of the validity of that or if that is just a archetypal experience that's being represented through the individual psyche what do you think about that yeah well you know the experience or well uh the experience of the beings takes place in your mind you know that's you know the arena you know that's the screen you know, that's the container for the experience. Um, so, you know, they appear in the mind, uh, you know, whether or not they're external or internal to us, we just can't tell right now. Um, but, you know, to the extent that they serve a function, um, they take the shape or form that uh, is best you know, suited to uh express that function uh so uh this returns again you know to their convincing and strange nature um we clothe information with the raw materials at our disposal so if uh we come from one culture or another culture or we believe certain forms convey 
a particular kind of information compared to others, you know, then that information will take, you know, visible shape in front of us, you know, based on our own characteristics, our own, you know, pre-existing mind. Because, you know, that's the raw material, you know, for any subjective experience. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think, I think that, you know, is the main thrust is that they take the form that's needed to get across the information which is needed. Hmm. Yeah, people seem to be more inclined to integrate particular pieces of information if it's presented to them by an archetypal mythological being than if it's just a thought that arises. And I, I agree with you in talking about how our our inclinations and our biases can shape the way that we interpret these experiences because somebody who's uh, very open to theistic or spiritual ideas may use the DMT experience as a way to further validate their perspectives. But somebody who is more psychologically inclined, for example, would probably use that experience to validate their worldview of seeing that everything is a uh, mental projection. So, yeah, we seem to, uh, um, it's difficult, it seems, to separate our, our individual um, beliefs and perspectives from the experience subjectively. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it isn't only our inclination and our biases, at least as commonly thought, you know, psychological biases or, you know, cognitive inclinations. Um, it also refers to or includes, you know, the brain. You know, what is the brain capable of concocting in response to a certain stimulus? Uh, and what about our experiences? If we're kept in a dark room our entire lives, we're not going to see things like cars and animals and clouds and things like that. Uh, but the information or the experience would be, well, yeah, it's hard to say. Well, you know, that's a tangent. Uh, but I think, you know, we, you know, take a psychedelic or there's a you know, psychedelic stimulus that occurs naturally uh, and certain things, um, you know, certain things appear, you know, based on the raw materials that we bring to the table. Uh, so it isn't only that we are opinionated, it's also, you know, you know that we have limits to, you know, what our imagination can generate. Uh, so the issue of being a, you know, fundamentalist, let's say, among psychedelics, uh, you know, can occur. Uh, you know, the case in point I always like to raise is that of Charles Manson. You know, Manson, mm -hmm. you know, gave LSD to his you know, subjects, as it were, and, you know, turned them into people that they always had wanted to be, or they thought might be a good way to be. Um, you know, the people in his group were, you know, psychopaths, criminals. They, you know, had an axe to grind against society. And, you know, Manson convinced them of this weird, you know, system of belief called Helter Skelter, uh, which, you know, cemented, you know, their conviction about the rightness of certain ways of being and thinking and doing. You know, so uh, you can be convinced by all kinds of crazy things that come your way under the influence of, you know, psychedelics. But you need to be moving in that direction in the first place. You know, that was the reason LSD never turned out to be that good a tool for training assassins. Uh, because if you weren't already moving in that direction, you're not going to start moving in that direction because of LSD. On the contrary, you know, but if you think it would be cool to be an assassin, you've been studying, you know, martial arts your whole life, uh, you love guns, and you can volunteer for an LSD study that will you know, turn you into an even more convinced you know, dedicated, devoted assassin. You know, so it just depends on what you're working with, um, you know, both the experience itself and the ultimate outcome. Mm. 
yeah, it's like an it's an amplifier of sort of who we are already in a lot of cases. Stan Groff used to talk about LSD as a non-specific amplifier of the unconscious, but I think it's a non-specific amplifier of you know consciousness itself. You know, the unconscious, the conscious, the pre-conscious. Yeah, it, it it just you know shines a spotlight on the mind, all nooks and crannies. Right, and it can just exaggerate our personality traits and things like that. Um, but occasionally can also introduce insights that can, can change behaviors and, and things as well. Um, I'm so what are you most interested in when it comes to psychedelic research today? I know that DMT has become extraordinarily more popular since the release of your book. Um, and the consequent documentary that was created based off of it. And I'm curious if you see that as a, as a good thing. Do you think the widespread use and exploration of DMT is a positive thing? Or do you think that that could have some unforeseen consequences on the collective consciousness? And... I think that the world we live in now in regards to psychedelic research is probably much different than it was when you conducted your research into DMT and what research that's being done now most interests and fascinates you. Um, yeah, the, our study with DMT occurred from 1990 to 1995 and, uh, it pretty much just came out of the blue. I mean, I was working on it behind the scenes for a couple of years and then just started doing it. So it, it took at least you know, 10 years for the rest of the research community to catch on. And I helped steer the earlier groups to their being able to obtain permission uh, to perform studies with other Schedule of one drugs. Uh, you know, so it was kind of... Uh, it was kind of strange. I mean, I was the only person in the world giving DMT. I was the only person in the U.S. giving any psychedelic drug. We also started some you know, psilocybin work, you know, toward the end of my stay in Albuquerque. You know, so, I mean, it was completely out there. I mean, I was totally on my own. Um, I didn't really have colleagues. Uh, the department at UNM just wanted me to do good work, but, to, you know, and to not cause any trouble, which which I did, uh, or you know, uh, you know, met those goals, uh, but they weren't able to you know really kind of you know shepherd the work you know forward because it was just you know so unexpected. Um, you know, so nowadays, I mean, everybody's going into psychedelic research. There's papers, there's conferences, there's startup venture capitalist pharma companies, educational foundations. Uh, yeah, it's just really quite a lot more, you know, popular and accepted. Uh, you know, still, it's a niche, uh, but compared to, you know, 1988 to 1995, it's a lot, you know, larger niche. Uh, I mean, I was a niche of one. Uh, so, uh, yeah, you know, there's a lot more, you know, freedom uh, to study, you know, psychedelics now. Uh, but I think, you know, the important questions still remain, which is how psychedelics exert their effects, especially their beneficial ones, or any effects, beneficial or detrimental. Uh, so I think the emphasis on the mystical experience is, uh, you know, misdirected. Um, I think it can be helpful, but I think other experiences on psychedelics can be helpful, too. That's just not been studied uh, as carefully. Uh, so. Um, one of the things I've come to believing is that you know, psychedelics, you know, like above and beyond their perceptual effects, are super placebos. Uh, you know, which is the medical, uh, you know, the medicalization of um, the uh, non-specific mental amplifier idea. Um, you know, they activate the you know, healing or 
you know, the transformative, you know, processes within the human body and mind. Um, and their non-specific effects. You see people like, uh, you see effects like, you know, Charles Manson and the Hells Angels. You see, uh, you know, the abolition of terminal, of, you know, the despair of terminal illness. You stop drinking, you stop smoking, you appreciate nature more. You're a better spouse. Your OCD goes away. Your eating disorder stops. Your OCD, um, your depression improves. You know, so it isn't as if these things aren't happening or they're imaginary. They're true. These results are occurring. Uh, but I think it's a non it's it's a specific manifestation of a non-specific you know, process, which is directed in you know, certain directions. You know, for depression, it's to feel better, not feel so guilty, to see uh, things differently. For, you know, drug abuse, you stop using drugs. You're convinced of the reality, the truth, the importance, the validity, the undeniability, the inexorability of not using drugs anymore. You know, that occurs on a psychedelic state. Um, or it you know, can if it's, you know, directed in that direction. And, you know, the more you direct it that way, the more likely you will see the outcomes that you're looking for, both you and your uh, you know, clientele. You know, so I think one of the areas of future research ought to hone in on the nonspecific placebo enhancing effect of the you know, psychedelics. Um, so mm -hmm. there's a strange, you know, twist, you know, to that idea. Um, you know, do you need to have any experience to activate the innate placebo response? Um, they're, you know, working on a study uh, in North Carolina, you know, developing non-psychedelic psychedelics. I'm not sure exactly how that's going to be defined, you know, but, you know, one of the ways in which, you know, they could be used is to determine if you need a psychedelic experience, you know, for the uh, results that you're, you know, looking for. You know, my guess is, Yes, I mean, if you if you look at any studies, uh, the experience is correlated with the effect. Uh, so to have no experience, it just seems unlikely that you'll have an effect. Uh, but I think the you know psychedelic you know drugs themselves can shed light on the placebo response. Uh, the you know, brain imaging changes, the pharmacology, all might be, you know, nonspecific uh, indications of the turning on of the placebo response. And, you know, then the other effects are, you know, more downstream, uh, you know, cognitively overlaid. Um, you know, psychedelics are being used more and more. I mean, you know, Michael Pollan's book has, you know, really, you know, popularized their use. Um, and, you know, primarily it's, you know, psilocybin, but still uh, the increase in research, which is, you know, summarized in Michael's book, you know, that all reflects a greater, you know, social acceptance of at least studying these uh, compounds and applying their effects to beneficial purposes. So, uh, you know, states are thinking about, you know, legislating, you know, toward the legality of, you know, certain, uh, you know, psychedelics, um, especially psilocybin. Um, you know, some with respect to ayahuasca, um, you, know, you know, not that much, you know, for MDMA or LSD, which are both, you know, synthetic. I think there's a push to emphasize the occurrence in the natural you know world of the psychedelics which are being pushed to be more popular or you know decriminalized um you know dmt is still pretty much a niche drug i mean there's a lot of people drinking ayahuasca which contains dmt and there's a lot of people smoking dmt you know pure dmt got a call from a reporter in seattle you know wondering if i knew about you know, people, um, you know, putting DMT into vape pens and smoking DMT that way, 
which was news to me, but I guess uh, it's a phenomenon. Uh, so, you know, with any increased use of you know, psychedelics, you're you know, bound to see adverse effects. You know, hospitalizations, emergency room visits, you know, suicides, you know, crazy shit. Um, but still, you know, that's the price you pay for increased availability. At the same time, uh, you'll see a lot of people being, you know, becoming more committed to certain, you know, causes or beliefs that they were before. You know, this is kind of like the 60s in a way. You know, we have a really oppressive government. As, you know, there's all this uh, push to become uh, authoritarian all around the world. And, you know, people, especially young people, are saying, forget it. You know, this is bad. But I think, you know, one of the, you know, which is like, you know, Vietnam. You know, everybody was, you know, sending people to Vietnam to die. It was just completely insane. And our president was, you know, Richard Nixon. Um, so uh, it, you know, turned out that, you know, there was a you know, confluence of you know, social unrest and increased, you know, psychedelic use. Uh, and it isn't to, you know, say that, you know, psychedelics were dangerous because they made you think differently. On the contrary, they were dangerous because they convinced kids that they had to do something, that they had to resist and fight back. So I think we're, you know, coming upon a uh, you know, similar time in history. There's a lot of social unrest among the youth, and there's a comeback of, you know, psychedelic drugs. So you might ask, you know, how do we repeat, or, you know, how do we, you know, how does the youth, you know, not repeat the mistakes of, you know, the elders? Well, you know, there's no guarantee. I mean, this whole thing may be shut down next week. You know, uh, you know Trump may say, what are these psychedelics? They're making people protest. So we have to really lock them up again. So I think, you know, one of the things we need to do, you need to do, but, you know, we need to do as well to be responsible in handing over the legacy is avoid Pied Pipers. Avoid Pied Pipers. You know, don't let people become spokesmen who don't know what they're talking about and who have their own mm -hmm. personal agendas that they want to advance, their own popularity, their own fame, their own power. You know, you know, look for the modest ones doing psychedelic work and uh, educating, um, encouraging proper use. Um, you know, so avoid Pied Pipers. You know, don't overreach, which I guess involves Pied Pipers. You know, don't start, you know, don't talk about mystical experiences, you know, because, you know, fundamentalist evangelical uh, types are going to say, what's this mystical experience? It's just a drug. You know, so to say it's a mystical experience, I think, is inviting trouble. You know, same thing, too, in a way, for me talking about, you know, prophecy and, you know, psychedelics. And it is a more, you know, nuanced approach, but I think that would be, you know, lost on the traditional, uh, you know, theologian. Um, you know, at the same time, you know, Judaism isn't as aggressive by and large, as Christianity. So I think there's more risk coming from the mystical Christians than from, you know, the rabbinical Jews. Um, you know, so don't overreach. You know, no Pied Pipers, you know, don't overreach. And uh, just, you know, keep it cool. Don't talk about psychedelics, you know, so much. Um, yeah, I mean, they're, you, you know, they're not panaceas. Even though they are panaceas, they're more placebo panaceas. They, you know, get you to where you want to go or convince you of where you want to be convinced. But, uh, you know, don't imbue them with some kind of idol worship. Don't, you know, don't, you know, worship, you know, the idols. Uh, you know, it isn't, you know, the drugs. It's your own hearts and, you know, souls which are being activated. Uh, you know, through the stimulatory effects of the drugs, but uh, you already were working with that material. So don't put those drugs on pedestals. Um, you know, they don't really possess any inherent spirituality in themselves. So, you know, no Pied Pipers, don't overreach, and, uh, you, know, you know, don't become idol worshipers. Mm. Yeah, those are wise words. Thank you. And I think it's um, it's similar creatively. I think that people sometimes look at psychedelics like you could, you know, give anybody who's never played guitar LSD and their Jimi Hendrix, and it doesn't really 
work that way. It's, it can be a, a tool to access new creative states of mind, but it should never be a, uh, a crutch. And it's not as simple as you just give somebody a psychedelic and suddenly they're a creative genius. Uh, well, that's for sure. I've seen plenty of examples of that. And also, I think that as hard as it is to speak about the DMT experience, and I do think that artwork can potentially be a better way of describing the experience, uh, it's also quite difficult to paint the DMT experience or to describe it in music as well, because the the experience is hyperdimensional, and we only have these three dimensions to play with here to try to render something for people to view and, and to experience. But um, yeah, it's a it's an interesting challenge, right. one that I've undertaken to try to paint the DMT experience. Well, you can, you know, much more easily, you know, paint the DMT experience than describe its verbal content, you know, the information that's contained there. You know, so that is consistent with, you know, my idea that psychedelics primarily stimulate the imagination. And the imagination is the mental location of perceptions and feelings and, you know, physical experiences, as opposed to uh, stimulating the intellect. It isn't like you come up with new ideas. It's mostly uh, amplification of what's already there. You know, so that's, you know, why, you know, that's not as inspiring as, for example, um, the aesthetic uh, productions which come out of a DMT experience. You know, the artwork and the music is much more capable of capturing its essence, you know, than, uh, than words. Mm. I'm curious about your vision for psychedelics in the future. How would you like to see psychedelics integrated into our culture? And do you think that decriminalization is a good idea? Oh, oh, you know, there was one question that you asked that spurred, uh, uh, it spurred, uh, it spurred an association uh, to a okay. book by Philip K. Dick. Um, are you familiar with, with you know, P.K. Dick? Um, yeah, I've read some of his books, but I'm not the most diehard fan. Yeah, you know, one of his, you know, books is called The Three Stigmata of Palmer Eldritch. And it's an interstellar war, which is being fought with psychedelic drugs. Uh, you know, th th there's one you know, drug called Chu, Chu Z. Oh, gosh, I can't remember which is which. You know, but there are the, oh, and there's Chu Z and Can D. You know, Can D comes from the stars. Chu Z comes from Earth. And there's a competition, in a way, between who's going to get the market share uh, of that of those drugs. You know, so you know, there's this interstellar thing called Palmer Eldritch, who's the you know, salesman for the interstellar drug, and it's a very strange story because you don't really know what's going on. Uh, it's kind of like, you know, Dick's imagination, you know, takes you to an interstellar place and you're trying to understand it and, you know, picture it. And, you know, then you're on another drug, uh, which is really kind of benign or not benign, but, you know, banal. You make a dollhouse and you live your life through the characters in this dollhouse. So uh, with the increased commercialization of, you know, psychedelics, you know, you could really go in some dark places. You, you know, who's going to get, you know, the market share? Uh, you know, genetic engineering, you could turn on the DMT synthesizing enzyme or other, you know, psychedelic substances made in the body, which will be discovered, I'm sure. You know, so, you know, do you get, you know, genetically engineered to be producing more of those? Um, so that got us a bit off track. You know, maybe you could uh, return to that last question that you asked and I'll you know, try to work on it. 
what is your vision for psychedelics in the future and how do you feel they could be best integrated into our culture? Yeah, but I see, I see where you're going. Well, you know, right. We have to be careful about the future. Uh, You know, even though everything is been determined or even though, you know, God knows the future that doesn't affect it. You know, so uh, we still need to control our own future as best we can. So, yeah, and if it really goes off the rails, you've got a story like P.K. Dix. Um, but, you know, hopefully that won't happen in, in the meantime. Um, you know, I think, I think people ought to be able to take, you know, psychedelics if they want to. Uh, and if they're capable, more or less, and, you know, there aren't any major contraindications. Um, you know, you don't, you know, willy nilly want to be dispensing LSD from the McDonald's down the street. You know, there needs to be some screening. Uh, there needs to be some you know, preparation. There needs to be follow up you know, supervision of the drug state itself. You know, but if you want to go in to a trip, uh, you know, uh, you go to a bar, you have a martini or you have a glass of wine. I mean, you've got certain drugs for certain, uh, you know, desired effects. Uh, if you're an artist or a scientist working on a you know, creative problem, uh, you know, you ought to be able to, you know, check in to a clinic or a center or a site or, a, you know, a more an office, you know, where you can trip, you know, safely, be, you know, be screened, uh, trip, you know, safely, be followed up. Um, you know, they're doing that in a way now with, 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 uh, you know, ketamine. It's, it's a bit of a, it's, you know, kind of a, you know, narrow approach, uh, you know, sure, it's, you know, purely for enhancing the effect of antidepressants. If you're depressed, you're not getting, you know, better on your antidepressant, you can snort ketamine in a clinic or a doctor's office, you know, two or three times a week for a month, and then twice a week for another month, and then once a week or every two weeks after that. You know, that's ketamine, which is very psychedelic. Uh, Mm-hmm. You know, but it's, you know, for a specific indication, you're depressed, you've never been psychotic, there's no family history of psychosis, you're not taking other recreational drugs. You know, so it isn't that far a stretch to imagine other conditions or other other wishes being addressed through those kinds of models, um, you know, wellness models. You do yoga, you do a fast, you do cleansing, you chant. And you trip on psilocybin, you know, that would just all be, you know, part of the wellness package. Uh, So I don't think that's too, you know, too far off. Um, And, uh, you know, to the extent that it trickles down, uh, gets disseminated into the larger populace, uh, I think it could be beneficial. At the same time, you know, shady characters will get their hands on psychedelics, you know, guys like Manson or Hell's Angels types. So we can't Mm -hmm. be caught off guard. We can't be caught flat footed, you know, with horror stories. Um, Oh, actually, you know, that would have been the fourth thing that I would have mentioned about advice. You know, be prepared for horror stories. Uh, You know, have your answers ready. Like another Charles, another Charles Manson is, you know, bound to appear you know, mark my words. Uh, wow. So you'll need to be you know, prepared. Like, you know, uh, you, you know, what's the story with, you know, psychedelics and how did he do that? And does that mean that, you know, psychedelics make you insane and they ought to be strictly, you know, regulated again? So, uh, you know, mm. you know uh, so I think if you can be prepared for that eventuality, you'd be in uh, you know, better shape than we were too. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I just want to ask you a couple more things. I'm curious about the relationship with schizophrenia and DMT and if there has been any indication that schizophrenia could be caused by some, I don't know, overactivity of DMT in the brain. I know this artist, Louis Wayne, I don't know if you've heard of him before, but he was an illustrator in the 19th century that created these kind of uh, kitschy illustrations of cats. And then he developed schizophrenia. And after developing schizophrenia, his art became extremely psychedelic. And it relates a lot to the kind of tryptamine state, a lot of geometry and uh, contrasting colors and 
things like that. So uh, it seems like his experience definitely became more psychedelic in a, in a traditionally psychedelic kind of way. But I'm curious what you think about that, because I know very little about the neurology of schizophrenia. Yeah, well, so once they discovered, you know, DMT and human body fluids, they first you know, thought of schizophrenia, like do schizophrenics produce you know, you know, too much DMT or do they not break it down uh, as efficiently uh, as people without schizophrenia? Uh, you know, same with bipolars, you know, mania can be psychotic. Um, yeah, you know, so the jury's still out in a way. Uh, they weren't able to uh, distinguish between, you know, levels in, you know, normals versus schizophrenics. But in you know, some ways, you know, that was because of the methodology issue. You know, the assay techniques for measuring DMT weren't as refined as they could have been. You know, so there may have been, you know, differences, but the equipment wasn't uh, capable of, you know, seeing them. You know, it you know, may turn out that we need to look at the gene expression of the DMT synthesizing um, enzyme uh involved in dmt instead of you know levels of you know dmt itself uh you can visualize the activity of the neurons which make dmt uh so uh you know that might be a you know, better way of comparing you know the biology of uh schizophrenia um with uh you know non schizophrenics um you know back in the day they were developing an anti dmt vaccination, uh, which really never panned out, you know, but they're doing studies now with, you know, knockout mice, which, you know, don't produce the gene or which, which, you know, don't, you know, make the enzyme, uh, you know, for DMT synthesis, you know, so those animals are being studied, you know, what happens if you don't have the enzyme, which makes DMT? Um, what is there, you know, do they what dream differs about more, their behavior? You know, how are, how are they different? I'm well, that's curious. being studied, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's being studied right now uh, at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Yeah. 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 yeah so those, you know, those wow, animals are being you know, carefully observed. Yeah, it's strange. Um, you, you know, so if there were more DMT produced in schizophrenics, would you know, they respond to DMT like non-schizophrenics do? You know, so that was kind of debatable. You know, there were some studies like that performed in the you know, 50s and the 60s, which, you know, weren't all that conclusive. You know, they were also interested in comparing the DMT visions with those which occur in schizophrenia. And, you know, some reports said yeah, you know, some reports, um, you know, said no. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, it's a, you know, it's an area that ought to be studied again, you know, now that we can give DMT. Um, you know, there was a German study a few years back, you know, comparing, you know, ketamine um, with DMT in normal volunteers in terms of schizophrenic symptoms. You know, so DMT, you know, reproduced, you know, certain, uh, you know, features of schizophrenia um, and ketamine, uh, you know, caused others, you know, which is an interesting editorial in a way on you, you know, see what you're looking for. Uh, if you're interested mm -hmm. in the theory of DMT and schizophrenia, you give DMT to normals, you give them schizophrenia rating scales, and their scores are high. You know, so does that mean that they were schizophrenic or prophetic or mystical? No, it just means that their scores on certain questionnaires were high. So, um, yeah, you, you know, so the DMT schizophrenia story isn't, you know, dead, and it ought to be, you know, resurrected. Um, uh, because there were a lot of questions that couldn't be answered back then, which I think could be studied, uh, um, you know, more now. Are there any researchers currently doing research on DMT? Um, well, there's one study at Imperial College in London, Christopher Timmerman is giving DMT. Uh, and he's you know published. There's a group in Germany, I believe, that's giving DMT, uh, but I don't think I've come across any of their you know papers or abstracts yet. Uh, and that's pretty much it. 
you know, there's ayahuasca research in Brazil it's in, and in Spain, other parts mm -hmm. of Europe, but there's only those two DMT studies. You know, there's a you know, drug company called Atai, A-T-A-I, uh, which is, you know, buying up other, you know, drug startups, you know, psychedelic, you know, drug startups. Like, you know, there's an Ibogaine, you know, company in Florida, you know, they just bought that. Um, and they're also doing spinoffs, you know, subsidiaries, you know, they're developing subsidiaries. And, uh, you know, one of them is called Viridia, uh, which I guess is a play on Psychotria viridis, which is the DMT containing plant in ayahuasca. Yeah, you know, so they sp spun off a you know, subsidiary, you know, called Viridius or, you know, Viridia. Um, and, you know, they're, you know, looking to use DMT uh, for, you know, psychiatric problems or conditions. Uh, so, uh, you know, they were, you know, they're interested in the schizophrenia story. If you could, you know, develop an anti-DMT, would that be an effective anti-psychotic you know, agent? Hmm. Interesting. Well, I really appreciate your time, Rick. I just wanted to ask you before we go, because I asked you at the start of this conversation, how your own personal experiences with DMT have impacted your life. And I was hoping you could share a little bit about that. Uh, sure. Yeah, well, so up until, you know, just last year, I was you know, kind of uh, in the closet about my you know, psychedelic use. And uh, I did an event with you know, Graham Hancock in Sedona last year, and we agreed I would, you know, talk about, you know, my DMT experience. Uh, yeah, you know, so I talked about it, you know, then, and I have referred to it a couple of times, you know, since then. Yeah, you know, um, it was 1986, I think, maybe 1987, you know, one of those years. Um, and I was at a, um, you know, conference uh, um, with Terrence McKenna, and I had given a you know, talk on DMT. It was a year or two before I began my study. Uh, and he said, well, you're talking about DMT. Do you want to try some? So, uh, you know, we went to, you know, one of the rooms at the, um, at the you know, conference center. Yeah, and uh, he gave me DMT. I smoked it, um, and I had a vision of uh, a flaming waterfall, maybe you know, forty feet you know, tall or so. You know, flaming colors, uh, you know, from a waterfall, and uh, like about a half a dozen of these little beings emerged from the waterfall, like you know, four feet high, you know, three, four feet high, you know, maybe six, maybe eight, you know, no more than ten, uh, and they appeared out of this you know, waterfall. And they said, now do you see? Now do you see? Now do you see? You know, like over and over and over again. It just reverberated in my mind. Yeah, so I, you know, came out of that slack-jawed and, uh, you know, described it to Terrence. Um, yeah, so, and, and um, we talked about it. Uh, and we stayed in touch. Uh, you know, after you know, that experience, uh, I decided to study DMT instead of melatonin. You know, like, you know, I was you know, sitting on the fence, you know, one of those things, you know, sitting on the fence, you know, should I pursue melatonin? Should I, you know, switch to DMT? It's, you know, high risk, uh, you, know, the, you know, who's studying DMT, who's studying psychedelics? You know, but I, I, I smoked DMT and it was like, okay, study DMT, forget about melatonin. So um, I changed, you know, research approaches, you know, topics. And, uh, you know, then well, like a year later, I was up at Terrence's place up in Marin. Uh, and I had, you know, stopped the melatonin work, or I was, you know, winding down. Uh, and we brainstormed about what kind of DMT study to do and, you know, where to get the money from and all that. So, you know, like after a you know, long afternoon of brainstorming, uh, we came up with the skeleton or the scaffolding, you know, the model for the DMT study. Give a lot of DMT to people that you know who are experienced with, you know, psychedelics and describe the effects uh, as carefully as you can. And uh, <clears throat> with respect to, you know, where to get, uh, you know, funding, you know, we you know, realized that the war on drugs was giving, you know, money to everyone to study drugs. 
So we or I applied to get you know, funding from the war on drugs. So you know, that's the organization of, you know, the division of MI, of, you know, the, well, <clears throat> we received, uh, you know, grants from the National Institute of Drug Abuse, which is one of the divisions of the National Institutes of Health. And, you, and, you know, they were funding back then and they're continuing to fund, uh, you know, research on drug abuse. You know, so it was a, you know, case of describing my interest in DMT as uh, important for public health, as opposed to important for uh, exploring consciousness or spirituality. It was the same study, you know, nonetheless, but uh, it you know, required careful framing. Well, if, if you had not smoked DMT, it's possible that all of the psychedelic research that's happened since would never have occurred. So that was quite a fateful DMT trip. Uh, yeah, it was a big trip. Yeah, yeah, I was completely knocked off my feet. I kind of still am in a way, or everything you know, since then has been a result of that experience, but you know, hard to say. Wow. Well, thanks for sharing that experience, and thanks for your time, Rick. This has been a really fascinating conversation. It's when I think about DMT, it just provokes more questions. I think that as the ongoing research into it, uh, yeah, it produces more questions than it does answers. And there is so little we know about that, that, ex that experience right now. And yeah, it'll be interesting to see within our lifetimes what new information is revealed about making sense of it all. Um, right. Well, I think uh, at the very least, it'll uh, you know help us understand our mind brain complex. You know how it's put together. You know what it consists of. You know, how to optimize it. Uh, so at the very least, it'll be you know, helpful for understanding consciousness. Absolutely. Well, thank you for your time, Rick. Okay. Sure. Thanks, Jake. It was fun.